and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You may be seated. I don't know if you noticed the title of my sermon. I normally don't even think about the title as far as putting it in the bulletin. Anybody catch that? It's a scary topic. Whew. Makes me kind of not want to record this uh, sermon so I have a record of it. So maybe it'll just go away when I'm done talking about it. Um, it's the politics of Jesus. Um, have you ever thought about the politics of Jesus? There are politics of Jesus. We're in the midst of a political time. It's everywhere, right? Sports, uh, education, healthcare, um, religion, the economy. Politics are everywhere, right? And, and people are on different sides. Good, well-meaning people are on different sides of debates, right? So what about the politics of Jesus? Where does that fall out? So I'm going to share today just some thoughts just one picture, because in the scriptures, there's different pictures of politics. Now, if you're like not old enough to vote, don't zone out, because this isn't just about politics. It's about who we are as God's people, okay? Um, so if you don't like, about po don't, don't like politics, still stay tuned. So I'm going to use two twangy songs and one Mark Twain quote, quote to kind of frame what I'm going to say today, okay? So the first twangy song comes from Kenny Rogers. Anybody a Kenny Rogers fan? fan? He has some great songs. Uh, one of his songs, he quotes, his, his lines is, If I knew then what I know now. Anyone know that song? Okay, good. All of you know it. <laughs> well, if you don't, now you do. It, the line is, If I knew then what I know now. And the, thing, the idea behind this is that if people knew what was going to happen in the future, they would do something different now, right? Like a while back, if you knew what was going to happen, you would buy up stock in Apple, right? Or a year ago, you'd buy stock in Zoom, right? You would do these things if you knew. Uh, you would major in education instead of basket weaving, just because you would know it would turn out better, right? Uh, you wouldn't have taken that first drink, that first drug. Your eyes would have bounced a lot quicker than they did. Whatever it is, I would have, I would have, I would have, right? If you knew what was going to happen. And we wish that we have do-overs in all different parts of our life, right? We wish that we could see into the future what's going to happen so that we know how to act right now. And part of that is who to vote for, how to vote, what to think about in politics. So I want to go back in history a little bit. Some of you guys love history, so I'll just throw this out. Some of you were alive then, at least some of your parents were alive. In 1928, the American people voted for the Republican candidate Herbert Hoover. Remember him? What a great president, right? It didn't turn out so well. Like the depression was around the corner and things went really bad, right? So if the American people could go back, maybe they wouldn't have voted for him. Or even going back a little bit further, some of you who are about 170 years old, you'll remember this. There was this guy named Franklin Pierce. He was a, a Democratic candidate and he was elected president. You may not even know who he is, but as I was reading, what I learned is that some of his policies that he did set in place like a one-way trip to the Civil War. If we had elected someone else, maybe we could have avoided the Civil War. So going back in time would have been nice. So if we know now, if we knew then what we know now, we would do a lot of things differently, right? But the truth is we just don't know how our leaders are going to respond to the challenges that are around the corner, because we don't know all the time the challenges that are around the corner. And as I said, politics is everywhere right now. So. The scripture that we come to today is a very political scripture. And what it does is it helps us think about politics from a Christian perspective. So if you've ne raise your hand if you've never really thought about Christ uh, politics from a Christian perspective. Anyone? Some of you have. Who likes politics? By the way, I should have asked this a long time ago. All right. The rest of you don't like politics. You're like, hurry up, vicar. Hurry up. Well, we have to endure this time whether we like politics or not, right? Uh, we have to get through it. Um, so there's one scripture we're going to look at today, and it's only one. Uh, it's Romans chapter 13. It's printed in your bulletin. You also have a, a pew Bible that uh, Dave gave you. Uh, Romans 13 is printed there. And Romans 13, I just want to say, is only one of the scriptures that tells us how to act with politics. There are others, and I'll mention those later, but I just want to say that up front. There are other scriptures that give us the full counsel of God. So let's read Romans chapter 13 in your bulletin. I'm going to read just the beginning part of it. This is what Paul writes. 
Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgments. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, and an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Does anybody sort of wish that this wasn't in the Bible? This is a hard thing, right? Uh, remember where we left off last week with Romans chapter 12? Paul gave a vision of what it looks like to be God's people, people of light in a dark world. Remember that? He just tells us lots of things to do that is, is the vision of God's kingdom coming. And so here in Romans 13, he's continuing that. It's, we, we left off with more than a to-do list, but a vision. And now we have a vision of what it looks like to be God's people as members of the state. So looking back at this passage in Romans 13, what does Paul tell the Christians to do? So I'll give you a moment. I would like you to answer that. What does Paul tell the, the people in Rome, the Roman Christians? What do they say to do? Be subject to the authorities. What else? Do not resist unless you want to incur judgment, right? Anything else? Do what is good. Yeah, exactly. And there's a few things at the end, too, that we really don't like. Oh, Margie tells us taxes, right? Who likes taxes? Dumb question, right? No one likes taxes, revenue, respect, and honor to those above us in authority. So what Paul tells us to do is, to, is that he has put, I should say, why, does, why should we do these things? Well, Paul tells us why we should do these things, even if we don't like them. He says that the authority has been instituted by God, that he has put authority in place. So here's the thing about this. Paul is not saying that the individuals are in place, but that he puts authority in place. And that's a big difference. For Paul's world, there he lived in the Roman Empire, and he said that the Roman Empire has authority, and the authority has been instituted by God. So we can't necessarily say that God puts the exact person in, in power every time. Herbert Hoover, that was from God. Franklin Pierce, that was from God. Nero, that was from God. Paul isn't saying that. What Paul is saying is that authority has been put in place by God. Sometimes God does put people in place who are not good. Sometimes God, and this is what Luther liked to say, is that sometimes God puts bad rulers over bad people. That should kind of scare us a little bit, right? Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. At different times in the Bible, he put one guy named King Saul over the people that he was not a good ruler. The reason he was over them is to teach the people to not trust in kings. Another time he put Pharaoh over his people. Why? So that they would call out to God and, and receive his deliverance. Another time he put Nebuchadnezzar and other guys that you can't even pronounce over them to discipline them because they were worshiping idols. Sometimes God does put good kings in place, right? Some of you, you're like, yes, Ronald Reagan or whoever your, or FDR, whoever your, your favorite is. You say, God put that person in place. We don't know. Sometimes he does, like King David, King Josiah, uh, even a pagan king like King Cyrus would lead to the Jews going back home. That, my point is not that who God puts in place, the point is that God puts authority in place. And let me ask you, what are the authorities supposed to do from what we just read? What's their job? To, to rule? What else? Just say it if you've got it. Carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Okay. To punish wrongdoers for breaking the law. Anything else? They are God's servant. 
but what are they, so they're supposed to serve God, okay? What else? Can you find anything else? Those, I think we got, those are the, the main things. They're supposed to maintain order. They're supposed to keep the laws and protect the people, right? That's what they're supposed to do. So what Paul says is clear, but how we apply it today in America in 2020, it's not as clear, right? Where Paul was and where we are is a totally different place. Paul was writing to a, a, a Roman church, a, a church in Rome that had no power. They were still a couple hundred years away from, if you know your history, Constantine would be the first Christian emperor. So they didn't have power. And he didn't write to a people who, like us, were in a democracy, right? The only democracy they knew about was Athens, and that was a failed experiment. It just was a totally different world. Uh, and this Roman Empire wasn't always good. They didn't always keep order the way they were supposed to. Uh, don't you remember? They sometimes crucified innocent men. They weren't a perfect empire. Even though there's this thing called Pax Romana, right? Roman peace. There was peace, but it was at the cost of human lives. So all, I say all this to say Lutherans take this Romans 13 passage and they call this role of government to keep order, they call it God's left-hand kingdom. So everyone put your left hand in the air. This is going to be hard for some of you. <laughs> um, I get blinds and shades mixed up. Some people I know get right and left mixed up. But anyway, put your, your left hand, you can put it down now. So there is one king, but he reigns over the left hand and the right hand. So what am I talking about? This is just a way of thinking that Lutherans have put together. The left hand is the way God operates through government, through whatever authority is out there. He brings order and justice, and he keeps laws, and he curbs evil. That's what God does through the left hand, right? That's an exciting place to be. We all want to, to um, get um, pulled over for going 57 in a 55, right, or whatever it is. This is an exciting thing. We're so thankful for it. Well, we are, but it it's, doesn't bring any of God's mercy. So the problem for us is that there is how we're going to take this because we're in a different place, right? We're in a democratic republic. We are citizens, and we have all these rights and responsibilities as Americans, right? So my question for this before I move on, are we to, Paul says, I think uh, Kurt said, be subject. That's what Paul says. So my question, are we to be subject to the government always? So shake your head. Yes, no, maybe so. Some of you are saying yes. Are we to be subject to the government always? Oh, I'm getting some no's. I'm getting some I don't know's. Okay, so we don't know about this. We're a little bit unclear. So even without thinking about it, are we supposed to just be subject? No. So what about when the government turns a lie into a law? They turn lies into laws. When they don't carry out justice, like with Jesus, they crucified an innocent man. Like when they make it legal, like the Third Reich did, to kill Jewish people. Should we just obey the government and be subject? No, of course not. You're all shaking your head no. How about when they make it illegal or make it legal to kill unborn people? Or when they make it against the law for me, a white guy, to sit at a black a counter with a black friend down in the South? We would say, no, those laws are lies, and we don't follow them. There are many unjust laws on the books right now. I'm not going to take a poll, but can you think of any unjust laws on, on the books in America or other countries? Just shake your head yes or no. Can you think of anything that does not protect people that is legal? Some of you are saying yes, but we, have, we can talk about this more later. So what do we do? We need God's guidance right now. We need to pray for wisdom. We need our consciences shaped by the word of God, not the changing morals that happen to be popular for this season, right, 2020, that might be different in a few years. As much as possible, as Kurt reminded us, we are to respect the authorities, even when we don't agree. But we're not to be subject without question. So when we resist, we should resist with a clear conscience. And only, as Kara said, when we're ready to suffer the consequences. So right now, our political climate, if, you're, if you pay attention, I know some of you have already told me I don't pay attention to politics. That's OK. Um, but our political climate, it's inching closer and closer to the same place the Roman church was, where they were attacked for what they said. Jesus is Lord. They were blamed for things that they were not guilty of. So, as I mentioned before, there's other scriptures that round out the full counsel of God. I encourage you to read not just Romans 13, 
Read Revelation 13. Read Matthew chapter 3. There are places that describe the state as an idolatrous power, as a power that is not up to good. Like we could say the Third Reich was a power not up to good. So, as much as possible, we're to live at peace with all men. And if possible, we're to live a peaceable and quiet life. We are to pray, as 1 Timothy 2 says, to pray for those in government who hold authority. Pray for the president, whether you like him or not. Pray for your county executive, whether he tells you to cancel church services or not. Pray for the people in, in authority. But like the Apostle Paul, we must be prepared for things to sometimes go haywire. So I don't want to be alarmist, but I'm just thinking through this, and I wanted to share it. Uh, in 1930, in Germany, a lot of history today, I apologize. But in 1930 in Germany, there was a guy named Hermann Sass. And he was, like us, a confessional Lutheran. He spoke right before the Third Reich legally took power, right before Hitler was voted into office. And he was commenting on the same passage in Romans 13. And this is what he said. He said, listen carefully, a governing authority, whatever the government is, which knowingly or unknowingly allows the norms of the law to be dictated by the so-called legal consciousness of the time, sinks to the level of raw power. Now, that's a lot to say. Basically, he's saying governments can end up using force in ways that are not helpful for people. So as the left-hand kingdom, which might serve justice sometimes, but can also be the source of raw injustice, that's the left-hand kingdom. But there's also a right-hand kingdom. So put up your right hand. Give someone an air five, or if you're next to him, give him a real five. All right. So just as we have the left-hand kingdom where God rules behind the scenes in authority, so there's a right-hand kingdom. So I told you Kenny Rogers' song, and no one even knew what it is. So Kenny Rogers' song was, If I Knew Then, Would I Know Now? Maybe if I had someone sing it, you'd remember it. But there's another song. It's like Kenny Rogers. It almost sounds the same. This one's by Bob Seger. This one goes like this. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Anyone know that Bob Seger song? All right, so I'm getting some more hands there. Thank you. Uh, so the point is this, sometimes we wish that we could know the future, that's Kenny Rogers, but other times we wish that we could forget the past, that's Bob Seger, right? Here's what I mean, have you ever, I should say have you ever not, but really, have you ever done something that immediately caused you shame, that you wish you could undo, that you wish never happened, something you just fell into by your own, who you are? And when you've done that thing, you become less human. You become less whole. And you're sorry for it. You're like, it's broken you. So when you do those things, when I do those things, we wish that we could go back to not knowing. right? We wish we could go back to not knowing the shame and guilt from that act that we did. And that's a lot like Adam and Eve. If you know the story, Genesis chapter 3. This is what a good parent said. He said, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but... Of the, tree of, knowledge of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that tree. The day you eat of it, you will certainly die. Can we all agree that God was a pretty good parent? Yeah. Right. God was a good parent, right? Much better than any of us could possibly be. But his children, they fell away from the faith, right? They ate of the tree and they became ashamed. On that day, they died spiritually and passed that on to all of us as their heirs, as their children. They fell to a new realm. It's almost like they fell upward into the knowledge of good and evil, and they wished they, couldn't, they would be out of that. And then their son, Bob. Did you know that Adam and Eve had a son named Bob? Bob Seeger. Their son, Bob Singer, sings this for all of us. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. That song that's inside of us, it wishes that we didn't know the shame and guilt and corruption that we all know now. So all that to get us ready for the right-hand kingdom. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, open it up to Romans chapter 1. And Sam's going to pass the microphone around. If someone could read Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. Anyone want to read that for us? Throw your hand up. What's that? It's page 883 in the Pew Bible. Any volunteers to read? We have a... Uh, okay, well, well, there's two hands. Candy, you want to read it? Okay, Sam right here. Just hold it in front of Candy. Uh, it's, it's Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17.
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Right, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Thank you, Candy. We'll read one more in a second, Sam. If someone, in a moment, we'll read Romans chapter 5, verse 6. If someone wants to put your hand up, Sam's going to read that in a set, or someone will read that in a moment. But notice what Candy just read. She said, the power of God is displayed in the gospel. Not the power of God is displayed in the political machine around us. So the power of God for what? If you're still there in Romans chapter 1. What is the power of God good for? What? Salvation. Salvation. And salvation from what? From our shame, from our guilt. Salvation from a, a body that will be corrupted, right? That is corrupted. So, and Paul describes this in Romans chapter 5, this gospel. The gospel is the power of God. So what is the gospel? It's all over the place. You know it. But we'll read Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Someone want to read that for us? Okay, back there, Sam. Morgan wants to read it. Morgan, can you read up to verse 9? Thank you. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. All right, thank you, Morgan. So there's lots we could say there. The gospel is basically this, that, that God has given his son for us so that we could be righteous by faith. Ma we've been reading Matthew all you know, throughout this year. Matthew shows us how Jesus was crucified. Get this, in a political fashion, of course. That's what crucifixion was. But Jesus was crucified as king for his claim to be king. He was crucified as a political... Uh, rebel, rebel, basically. And other people didn't see it at the moment when he was crucified. Like, they didn't understand what was happening like we do now by reading what Morgan just read. But at, the, at that moment, when Jesus was crucified, there was one person, and that person was a Roman official, a centurion. And do you remember what he said when Jesus was, was pierced and Jesus died? Surely this man is the Son of God. Yeah, exactly. And that was quite a moment. Here's a quote from Mark Twain. He says, When I was a boy of 14, yeah, I'm going to do it, okay. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much, much the old man had learned in seven years. You guys hear that before? I apologize about the horrible accent. I take that back, delete that. Oh, that's Mark Twain. His point is not that his father learned so much in seven years. What's his point? He learned so much in seven years, right? And so in a way, I want you to think about that. That was the moment when this centurion had that kind of growing up. In a way, the death of Jesus changed this centurion, this Roman official who was enmeshed in politics, uh, from an arrogant 14-year-old into a man of 21, able to see the wisdom of God the Father. So my question is for you, are you that centurion? Now, of course, not literally, but are you that centurion? Have your eyes been opened to see that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah, amen. That he is the Lord of the kingdom of grace. So here's my declaration to you. I said it before and I say it again, that God has given his Son to die and to rise for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins, removes and forgets all your sins. You are that centurion. You are a citizen of America with a good role, a good role to learn about politics if you're not old enough, a good role to vote, a good role to engage in dialogue, a good role to love your neighbor at the voting booth. That's your task. But you're the centurion. You have seen something more. You have confessed that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Do you remember where... Paul leads us in Romans. We'll read one more verse. This is Romans chapter 10, verse, I think, verse 9. Anyone want to read that for us? Okay. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 9. This is where Paul leads us. Any volunteers? If you don't volunteer, Sam will just assign you. Oh, Emma, back there, Sam. Thank you, Emma. Read verses 9 and 10, Emma. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Amen. Thank you, Emma. So when, when Christians confess that Jesus is Lord, as Emma just read, that's where Paul led us, they are making a political statement. I don't know if you understand that. But when you say Jesus is Lord, you are confessing something political. That's not very obvious to us in America, because both parties like to say God is on my side. But other people around the world know it so well, because when they say Jesus is Lord, that leads to the end of their life. When you confess Jesus is Lord, you're confessing that Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lord, President of Presidents, Dictator of Dictators. You confess that every single knee will bow before him. You're confessing that our political machine, be it your favorite flavor, Republican or Democrat, you're saying that those things are not ultimate. Oh, I said we were almost done. We're going to read one more verse. I'd like Dave to read Romans 12, verse 2, because I know he likes this verse. Run over there, Sam. Sam's a good replacement for Charlie, but we can't replace Charlie. So Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, do not be conformed. Don't be just like the world. And this is what got Paul killed. This not conforming to the world got Paul killed, get this, by the government that he said to be subject to. So if Paul knew then what he knows now, would Paul have written this? Would he have said, let every person be subject to the governing authorities? Kurt and Melissa say, yes, you guys should agree with them. Yes, because Paul knew that these governments, whatever authority it is, they are temporary servants to create order. They're temporary, and even if they're um, handing out raw power, it will come to an end. So we don't know now what we'll know later, right? We don't know how things will go in our politics. We don't know what virus is around the corner. We just don't know how it's going to go. And I certainly am no prophet, thank God. Uh, but like Paul, who died as a martyr at the sword of Nero, we might, and I pray not, we might end up being the victims of raw power in this political landscape. I certainly hope and pray not. But until then, by the power of the risen Jesus, we'll continue to say Jesus is Lord and that he speaks through his word. So we're going to pray. We're going to vote. But we're also going to confess Jesus is my Lord. So taking our two statements, if I knew then what I knew now, we can't know the future, which stocks to buy this week. We don't know what's around the corner, but we know God will take care of that future there's a verse in 1 Corinthians that Paul quotes from the Old Testament. It says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Someday we will be surrounded by the kingdom of God's love. That's the future. The past. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. God will take care of this knowing also. As far as the east is from the west, God says, so far have I removed your sins from you, and we will not know them any longer. So this is my conclusion. Take a look at your bulletin cover. Anyone like that picture? I love that picture. It's a white horse, and what's he doing? He's standing. What else is he doing? He's looking. What else, Emma? He's walking. What's he doing with his ears? He's listening. All right, so I don't know if you know this, but uh, Jesus says that the Son of Man will come when no one expects him. That's him. He's going to come at some point, right? That's what we confess in our creed, that he's going to come again. And John, the revelator, John, in the book of Revelation, he says that Jesus will come back on a white horse as King of Kings and Lords of Lords. I don't know if it's symbolic of just coming in purity, coming in power, or if there's an actual literal white horse. I kind of like the idea that he's coming on a white horse. 
He's coming on a white horse that is listening and waiting and watching, just like we listen, wait, and watch as God's people. So with that, may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So having heard a long sermon, uh, let's rise and uh, confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed.